everyone, this is Jackie from Bronx Bobbles and I'm bringing you another exciting video. This video is for my Bronx Tale playlist. It's where I do book reviews based on jewelry. And today's book review will be on the New York Times bestseller, Stoned by Aja Rodden. This book is jewelry, obsession, and how desire shapes the world and as you can see from the book cover i um pretty much beat it up part of this is my fault um and part of it is bad bunny who likes to chew on my books for some strange reason she just loves to nibble on it it drives me absolutely bananas because she's destroying some of my precious books but anyway this book is not about marijuana or about getting high or stoned this book is all about jewelry and the fascinating stories behind them. And I'm a storyteller, so this is totally right up my alley. So stay tuned and I'll give you my book review on Stoned. A little bit about Aja Rodin's background, which is really important to the way this book is constructed. Aja studied ancient history and physics, which is sort of a scientific background. And that combination is really, really interesting. And she studied that in Chicago. At the same time, she was also working at one of the big auction houses called House of Khan. So she had access to beautiful, incredible jewelry. And even in addition to that, later on in her years, she became a jewelry designer. And so this really unique, distinctive background um, allowed her to write this incredibly crafted book with a really in-depth understanding of jewelry in many ways, the scientific, the historical, and the design. This book is broken down into three distinct sections. Want, have, and take. Wanting jewelry, having jewelry, and taking jewelry. And in those are stories, there's eight different stories, um, very distinct stories about jewels. She does a phenomenal job with research. And the way that her stories are constructed are very tongue in cheek. Very, very much like a college girl, uh, just writing to her friend, a little bit cheeky, a little bit cynical. Some of the tongue in cheek examples would be when she'll say cha-ching, or she'll say I'll bet, or she'll describe someone as a bit of a jerk and things like that. And so she'll throw those little, little sarcasms in there um, as you're reading along. So it makes it for an interesting read. You know, when you write about historical stuff and you go into history, it sometimes could be kind of dull and dry and just kind of like back in high school, it becomes hard to read. But she throws in these little, little anecdotes, little things that really, you know, make you laugh. And, um, and that's what pushed the story forward. I kind of feel like I'm talking to my girlfriend and she's telling me a little bit of stories about you know, uh, the history of jewelry instead of reading a very scholarly uh, book. And, and I happen to like that, although some people may be turned off by it, but it's really just a good way to get through a really in-depth research and her stories. So one of the first stories she speaks about is how the judge bought Manhattan for $24 worth of glass beads. And everybody has heard this story before. It's as if the Native American Indians didn't know, you know what they had under them. But what she explains is that um, the Amer Native American Indians didn't own or possess their land and they thought they were getting the better deal. So each party thought they were getting a great deal. The judge thought they were paying $24 for this incredible land and the Indians thought they're getting these glass beautiful beads for land that they don't even own. In addition, these glass beads were very unique. It was almost as if they found these incredible diamond treasures and so for them they felt it was a great exchange. And so that's one of the stories that are in her book. Another well-known story is about the Diamonds and the De Beers marketing campaign. And she talked about how 
Um, and she goes into really, into real deep depth uh, to the point where um, I learned so much about diamonds and how they're cultivated and where they're there, um, where you can find diamonds. And it talked about the political history behind diamonds um, and, and, and all of this. Um, but one of the things about diamonds is the marketing. You know, people thought that diamonds were scarce. And because of that, they had this beautiful rare stone. But what they didn't know at the time was that diamonds weren't really scarce at all. Um, they were plentiful. There was enough diamonds to go for everybody to have at least a half a carat of diamonds in this whole entire world. And then there'd be some more left over. Um, but the De Beers really understood that uh, marketing needed to happen. And so they hired this marketing firm that was run by two ladies who came up with the clever idea of creating a scarcity. And she sort of compared it a little bit to the Dutch tulip craze. And, um, but we're still going through the diamond situation. And diamonds really, and she says this in her book, and if you see some interviews on her, she talks about how diamond ring in, um, in an engagement ring really wasn't around for since um since as long as the microwave so it hasn't really been around that long but people feel like diamonds came through uh the history and so what she uncovers for us is that the history that they use to exploit diamonds and to show that diamonds have been around forever was a story that was massaged a little bit um it was kind of a tale that they elaborated on and the diamond wasn't even given between a man and a woman. It was between a man and a man, and it pertained to property. Diamonds are forever. She debunks that whole theory, and she explains the construction of diamonds and how they came about, and the fact that diamonds aren't really forever. At some point, because of the air and the pressure with atmosphere, diamonds will end up being a, a graphite in the future. Um, so the diamonds aren't really forever. And all of this was, was a marketing campaign against the Americans who had newfound wealth. And this European company wanted to exploit the American wealth. And so they came up with this idea of uh, spending two months worth of salary. And when people bought into this and bought two months worth of salary of a diamond ring, um, they decided to jack it up to three months and then jack it up to four months so that they can just get more and more. And all of this was really marketing. Um, and there's a whole other history when it comes to these diamonds and you really got to read it because it is a fascinating story. And I'm going to tell you one thing. If I ever did get married again, probably wouldn't get a diamond ring. Nah, probably more than likely it won't be a diamond. Another story that she spoke about was the emeralds and how the Spaniards went into South America and Central America and got these uh, emeralds and brought them back to Spain and how it, um, it, it funded the Spanish Inquisition. And so she goes into real historical depth of the, um, the emeralds and, and, and how it affected the country Spain. Also, she goes into real deep depth about how emeralds are made. And I think it's her scientific background that allows her to be able to do that. And possibly her background in um, the auction houses where she had to understand where these emeralds, the composition of emeralds were. Um, and she speaks about how emeralds were created by two plates in the the world that kind of collided and created this heat and on um, the shifting of it and I, I can't even get into all this this step you got to read it in the book but what she did explain and make very very clear that was that emeralds were probably the most rare stones uh, gems out there more so than even diamonds one of my favorite stories um, has to be in regards to the large Pearl called La Perenguina, um, which means in Spanish the wanderer, and how it exchanged from one hand to the next to the next and ultimately landed in one of the most famous iconic movie stars. It started out as a story where the pearl was found by a slave in Panama and was given to the prince. 
Um, and there's some controversy whether that story is true or not. You got to read it in the book. Um, but it was given to Queen Mary by Prince Philip as a wedding gift. And her sister coveted this jewel so much. Her sister was Queen Elizabeth. And there was a whole story about the two sisters and how uh, the, the, the king and the queen, uh, they, they sort of, uh, you know, she was sort of went crazy and she ended up perishing. But there's, there's a big story about that. But the part that I'm fascinated about the most was how it ended up with on in an auction in the 1960s and how Richard Burton paid $37,000 and bought this pearl for none other than my style icon, my jewelry collector aficionado, my sister from another mister, Miss Elizabeth Taylor. So I was so excited to read that story. I didn't realize that there was a whole history about some of her jewels and hopefully maybe one day I can do a, a video on Elizabeth Taylor's jewelry. Elizabeth Taylor spoke about how she lost this pearl. She couldn't find it and she was petrified because Richard Burden was right there and she knew that if she told him she lost the pearl, he would go absolutely bananas because he loved this jewel and he paid $37,000 for it. So she looked everywhere, she got on her hands and knees, Miss Elizabeth Taylor looking for this pearl and ultimately, guess where she found it? In the mouth of her little poochie. The doll was nibbling at it and gnawing at it and she pulled it out and thank goodness there wasn't a, even a scratch. It's one of my favorite Elizabeth Taylor stories. But another famous story that's in um, the book is the famous necklace, the affair of the necklace. This necklace that was, was made for this particular person and the person who was going to purchase it passes on and they had to get rid of this necklace and nobody could afford this necklace but Marie Antoinette and they have this huge story there's a film about it there's books about it there's a whole you know brouhaha over this story but ultimately this necklace um Marie Antoinette didn't want it they actually created a situation that let the people believe that Marie Antoinette was purchasing this necklace and it became one of the main reasons why she was considered the most hated monarchy. And it actually caused her to lose her head. So check that story out in the book. Another story was about the Fabergé eggs. And it goes into details about the specific different types of eggs and they're beautiful and they're incredible and they're gorgeous. And I actually have a necklace uh, by Joan Rivers that have these little tiny symbolic Fabergé type eggs. Uh, but it talks about how uh, the Fabergé eggs intertwined and connected with the famous uh, Tsar and his family, the Romanovs. Check that story out too. And then there was the story about the cultured pearls and how Again, in a sort of marketing campaign, Mikimoto of Japan created a, 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 and changed the way that people thought about a gem that was fabricated and handmade. Pearls were so coveted, people just adored their pearls. And he found a way to create pearls um, in the wild, because they're still considered pearls, but he, how he distinguished cultured pearls and got people to see pearls, uh, cultured pearls, as things of desire because there was a big, big uh, debate whether real pearls versus culture pearls and who would want to have culture pearls. And he changed people's minds about it. And I, th I think, I don't know, I'm guessing around 90% of pearls today are cultured pearls. Uh, but it also goes into the history of J Japan and how Japan was isolated from the rest of the world and how they had to open a trade and how Mikimoto put Jap Japan sort of on the map um, with his cultured pearls because he created this this um, this way to make these pearls that other people wanted to emulate. So check out that story too. The last story is on the wristwatch and how in World War I there was a need for men in the trenches 
to be very precise with their time so they could have uh, uh, precision bombings and attacks. And at, before World War I, uh, watches were pocket watches. They had to be shoved in pockets and they had a string attached to the buttonhole and you had to pull it out and look at it and you had to have your hands on it and then you gotta put it back in your pocket and you hope you didn't lose it. And um, there was a long period of time that women had watches on their wrist, real dainty. And it was one of the queens, and I forget her name, it's in the book, check it out. Um, she wore this really beautiful dainty wristwatch. And because of that, wristwatch were associated with women and not with men. And, um, but men got, yeah, during the World War I, saw a need for them to have watches available. And more practical for you to have your watch on your wrist instead of in your pockets and so they created these wrist watches um, um it was a sort of handmade and they took the pocket watch and they put it in and cased it in leather and they tied it around their wrists and it became very very popular and then the government started issuing it because timing became really really essential and then there was the idea that men's time was more precious than women's time because women didn't need to be anywhere specifically because women worked in the household and so men needed to you know uh, have it for very uh, precise reasons and so because of that the wrist wristwatch which was first thought of as a feminine piece of jewelry became a masculine jewelry and today most men have a wedding ring and a wristwatch but I'm also seeing some changes with men in jewelry. I don't know if it's because of social media, uh, but men are really experimenting more with necklaces and bracelets and jewelries and cufflinks and tie pins and all this sort of stuff. And I'm really excited about that um, because you know, for a very long time, men's jewelry really was just a wristwatch and a wedding ring. So what do I think of the book Stoned? Well, as an inspirational storyteller and wannabe jewelry historian, I loved this book. I mean, it's one of the first times I read a book that was more like a, a fictional, almost, so to speak. Um, there's not a lot of pictures here. It was just pure reading. And it took me a few uh, weeks to get through the book, only because I only read several sections um, a night. This book kept my attention, kept me fascinated, got me thinking about how jewelry really shaped some of history. Um, I always knew how important jewelry was to me, but I didn't realize and I didn't take it to the next level, which is how jewelry is important to historical significant things that happened in the world. So um, it gives me a new appreciation for jewelry, although I appreciate jewelry so much. Um, I like her tongue in cheek way that she writes. Um, and um, it made me want to learn a little bit more about the historical background of pieces of jewelry. Because sometimes you need to know the context of jewelry um, to really understand uh, the, the, the story and to appreciate the history. So I, I really enjoyed this book. And I would say that if you're a jewelry historian or jewelry lover, or if you like inspirational stories, then this is your books. Um, it became a New York Times bestseller for a reason. So I definitely give this a thumbs up. You tell me which one of these stories fascinated you the most. And let me know if there's a specific jewelry that you would like me to delve into a little bit more on one of my future videos. And I want to give a special thank you to all of you fabulous fans that really made my sister feel so, so welcome. I knew you guys would do her right. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and leave me a comment. Help a sister out. I'm trying to get to 1,000 subscribers and I'm close to 700 right now. So I'm getting there slowly but surely. And I'm going to do a contest once I reach 750 subscribers. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Con mucho, 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 mucho amor.